Well, good morning, and uh, thank you. I think Largo shouldn't just be played at funerals anymore. I want to give you all a warm St. Matthew's welcome to all who come to worship at St. Matthew's today, whether you are joining us in person or online. The congregation of Fort Massey, just down the street, is joining us for worship during this month of July. <clears throat> And for them and any other in-person visitors or visitors joining us online, my name is Ken Moores. I am a member of St. Matthew's, our usual and much more skilled minister. Reverend Betsy Hogan is enjoying a well-deserved vacation. So members of the congregation are standing in, if you will, as presiders for this service over the next month. Regular members of St. Matthew's congregation will have suspected that something was up when I showed up for the service on time today. <clears throat> I want to thank members of the worship committee. I think I want to thank members of the worship committee for asking me to be presider for this service. You may want to hold your thanks until after the service. And I must say, it's a little more unnerving to do this than usual, especially when one considers that this will be immortalized on the web so that a wider worldwide audience can see my shortcomings again and again and again. For those of you visiting St. Matthew's, we are the oldest established United Church congregation in Canada, having been established as a dissenter's church in 1749. The original church was located at the corner of Hollis and Prince Street just across from the provincial legislature. It burned down in 1857. This church was built in 1859, and those of us on the Board of Stewards would suggest it's been being repaired ever since. Finally, I want to thank Wayne Rogers, Ida Whitehouse, Gail Reiner, John Wallace, and Craig Wallace for their help in preparing this service. In terms of announcements, I have at least two. Number one, from Saturday, July 29th until Saturday, August 5th in Berwick, Nova Scotia, a mere 90 minute drive from here, the 152nd annual Berwick Camp Encampment will be held at Berwick in the beautiful Annapolis Valley. Each day in a hemlock grove, there are a variety of activities, seminars and worship. If you are interested, I would encourage you to make a day trip on a sunny day and join us under the hemlocks. Dress is camp casual. Type in Berwick Camp in your browser for more, infor for more details. Secondly, mark this in your calendars. On Monday, August 7th, from 1.30 to 4 o'clock in the gym downstairs, we will be celebrating a birthday party for our very own Molly Austin, who will not be 80, she will not be 90. She will be 100 years young. Mark it in your calendar. <clears throat> Are there any other announcements? Wayne, I believe you have one or two. Good morning. And Welcome to St. Matthew's worship service for today. Uh, we started this morning with a prelude, which was with cello and organ. And around Halifax, when we translate the word cello, it, what comes to mind immediately is Shimon Walt. And we are absolutely thrilled to have Shimon here this morning. Thank you so much. <clears throat> And when I asked him, would he like to, to uh, provide music for the solo? Well, he said, what about the prelude and the postlude too? And I said, okay, so we will, Shimon is going to provide music uh, later on in the service for our, um, our, our solo uh, section and then for the postlude as well. And we're very grateful to have him. However, as well, Shimon will be here as well on Tuesday for the second Summer Sounds at Barrington concert, and we're featuring the Rhapsody Quintet, and Shimon is one of the founding members 
of that. And on Tuesday at 12.15, we're going to hear two world premieres. Uh, one is by John Plant, and the other is by Barbara Pritchard, who was a, a former member of our congregation and pianist. So if you're around noon hour uh, on Tuesday, we'd love to see you at Summer Sounds at Barrington. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. Are there any other announcements? Okay. <clears throat> there being no other announcements, perhaps we can gather ourselves and join in the response of opening prayer whose words are on the monitor. We gather, O oh God, on this land that we share with the Mi'kmaq Nation under PD's treaties of peace and friendship. We thank you for your love and strength abiding with us and giving us hope and courage. Guide us in your goodness and grace, we pray, as we offer ourselves and our gifts to your work of love and justice, peace and reconciliation, comfort and care. Bless to us this time together in your presence. Amen. Perhaps one of the good things about being presider is that you can actually change the service. So I'm going to do that. Theologically, in sharing the peace of Christ by our greeting of one another, we open ourselves to the power of God's love to heal our brokenness and make us agents of love in the world. Practically speaking, this allows us to greet members of the congregation and build or rebuild community. We haven't shared the peace of Christ since we stopped doing it during COVID. Today, I'd like to reinstitute that practice. In whatever manner you feel comfortable, fist bumps, elbow bumps, or just plain greetings. So, the peace of Christ be with you, and also with you. After two and a half years, that was pretty good. Our first hymn was penned by Charles Wesley, that great leader of the Methodist movement, who indicated that hymns should be sung lustily and with great courage. I'm not exactly sure what he meant by that. However, the first hymn is, You Servants of God, found in Voices United, number 342, and the lyrics will also be on the monitor.
Our first reader is Ida Whitehouse, and the reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Thank you very much, Ken. It's a joy to read this scripture passage. It is a bit of a conundrum, though. Um, Paul oftentimes is telling us about things we should be doing. In this particular passage, he has sort of an inner struggle that's going on. And this is how it starts. I don't really understand myself. For I w what I want to do is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. And if I know that what I'm doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I've discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I'm a slave to sin. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Ida. Our second reader is Gail Reiner, and the reading is from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Thank you, Ken. It's, it is indeed from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verses 16 to 19. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others, we played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. The word of God.
Thank you. That was wonderful. Lord, your word is light. Let this light have its free course. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. When you agree to be presider for a service, perhaps the first thing you should do is check the lectionary, that published schedule of the various scripture readings and hymns for every Sunday of the year. So that's what I did. Fortunately, the identified readings for this Sunday aren't too confusing. There is no sleep-inducing passage from Numbers in the Old Testament with a never-ending series of begats and a multitude of unpronounceable names. Imagine my terror and your dismay if I'd had to preach on the passage, on the west under the banner of Ephraim shall camp under their leader as follows, Manasseh, led by Gamaliel, son of Pedazor, numbering 32,200. Friends, that would be deadly, deadly stuff. A reading from the Song of Solomon, which was listed, was tempting, as I consider the Song of Solomon to be the Old Testament equivalent of a Barry White or Marvin Gaye song. Fortunately, that reflection may just have to wait to some undetermined time in the future. So that leaves us with the passages from Romans that Ida read and two passages from Matthew, the one that Gail read and another one that I promise I'll close with. I did ask Ida to read the passage from Romans first. While I know that chronologically Paul's letters follow after the life of Christ, I wanted to address the letter to Romans first. In Romans, Paul is trying to explain his understanding of the Christian faith to members of the church of, in Rome, who he intends to visit. And he's trying to identify that the Christian faith is for both Jew and Gentile, as both are under the power of sin. The passage that Ida read for us is subtitled, The Conflict in Us. And in it, Paul clearly addresses the tension and conflict between knowing what is right to do by the faith and then what we actually end up doing. While he may dwell on what he might call bodily sin, I think we can extend this tension and conflict to all our acts. In fact, I would suggest there's been a little too much emphasis on bodily sins and not enough focus on other sinful acts and behavior. Those of you who were here a few weeks ago may recall that Betsy preached on chapter 12, verse 9 of Romans. And it's a section that identifies about 40 do's and don'ts in order to live in the faith. Things like love one another warmly as Christians, work hard and do not be lazy. I've heard that one a few times. Pray at all times, and so on. Sort of a shorthand for living a faithful life. So maybe we're thinking, there it is, simplified. All we need to do is those 40 things, right? Hold on, if only, if only it were that easy. Earlier in today's reading, Paul says, I do not understand what I do, for I don't do what I would like to do, but instead what I hate. Paul is facing up and acknowledging the fact that we are human we know exactly what we should do, but we often don't do it. We fail. We make mistakes. What an unhappy man I am, he says. And he says this behavior makes us a prisoner to the law of sin, which can only be redeemed through faith. Now, to the passage from Matthew that Gail read. It's about an event in Jesus' life. Jesus is out preaching. And John the Baptist, who's in prison then, he hears about this. So he sends some of his followers out to find out whether Jesus is the Messiah. Those followers and the people Jesus is preaching to, they want to know, is Christ the one that John foretold of? This idea of questioning whether someone is the one 
is a pretty common human reaction. It's the basis for a lot of our literature and most of our science fiction and fantasy. Think of Arthur in the Stone, Lord of the Rings, and yes, even the Matrix. As humans, we're always skeptical of messiahs and chosen ones, but I'm digressing a bit. So back to the story. So some of John, John's followers come to see Christ to see if he is the one. And Christ, well, Christ sort of unloads on them. He says, you're like a bunch of kids who shout. When we played wedding songs for you, you wouldn't dance. When we played funeral songs, you wouldn't cry. Then he says, you gave John a hard time because he fasted and he, drink, he, drink, he didn't drink wine. Yet, when I came and ate and drank among you, you said, look, he's a glutton and a wine drinker and is a friend of tax collectors and other outcasts. I can just hear that sportscaster on ESPN who says, come on, man. So here we have two points. The first is, as Christ identifies, when confronted with the divine as humans, at best we're unsure and we're confused and skeptical. Is this the one who John told us about? Or was John Elijah? At the worst as humans, we can be cynical and derisive. Look, he eats and drinks with tax collectors and other outcasts. Come on, man. But perhaps the even more important point in this passage is in that in this exchange, Christ is showing, even through all his divinity, his human frustration, and yes, his anger. While Christ may not be of this world, he certainly is in it. He too is human. So this is our lot as humans. There's an internal tension between what we know we should do and what we actually end up doing. We question, we're skeptical, we confuse things, we make mistakes, we're cynical, we fail. As the lyric from the song by the 90s group Human League said, I'm only human, made of flesh and blood. And I hope that clears up the mystery about the sermon title. Earlier, I mentioned that this in this congregation, we have a history of being dissenters. And in that context, I fully admit I struggle with some concepts. In particular, I struggle with some of the implications of diversity and reconciliation. And I don't think I'm alone. As an institution, this church has struggled over the centuries. In regards to diversity, while the church, and in particular Methodists, and Charles Wesley, the composer of our first hymn, was at the forefront of the anti-slavery movement, here's a little known fact. Some early Presbyterian members in this very province owned slaves. Here's another dissonance. While the United Church was one of several denominations that operated residential schools, we were one of, if not the first, to apologize. So where does that leave us? We're only human. Questioning is fine. We're dissenters after all. But when we really start down that line that might start with cynicism, but has, a, but has an end point somewhere not too far past disrespect and mean-spiritedness and very, very near hate, it's important to remember the flip side. And that flip side is that there's a bit of the divine in us all. We are all made in God's image. How many of you know Ben Crump? That was Crump, not Trump. I think we've got an image of Ben up there. Ben Crump is a lawyer in the United States and his focus is civil rights cases. Whenever there is yet another of the one too many instances of the justice ceiling dealing horrendously with African Americans, Ben Crump shows up there really, really quick. He's always impeccably well tailored, exceptionally and theatrically well spoken, and he stage manages the situation. And the human part of me does struggle with some of his rhetoric and the fact that he's made millions off of grieving families. 
but I just can't stop there. I have to remember that he too carries the baton. I have to remember that just like Job's comforters, at least Ben Crump shows up when folks are grieving. And more than that, he shows up and he works hard to help people who would have no concept of how or the resources to hold officials and systems to account. I have to remember that if the justice system were fair, there would be no need for Ben Crump. And I have to accept that the tears in his eyes were real when on one occasion, when addressing yet another in a seemingly endless series of desperate incidents, he looked into the camera and said, can we not just get to a place in this country where we accept that we are all children of God? Our faith recognizes that there is a tension between what we know we should do and what we actually do. Our faith, it allows us to be human. Being human may be part of the consideration and the explanation, but it is never, never an excuse or the end point. We don't have to finish the work of justice or reconciliation, but we do have to keep at it. The end point is the divine. If, as humans, we struggle with the questions and issues along the path, that's okay. Our faith allows it. And as we struggle trying to move the needle from the human to the divine, here's some comfort. And as I promised, it's the last scripture reading in the lectionary for today, which fortunately for both you and I, it needs no reflection or comment. It's in Matthew 11, verse 28, and it's beautiful. Come to me, all you who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke and put it on you and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest. For the yoke I will give you is easy, and the load I will put on you is light. God being our helper, may it be so as we humans stumble forward. The second hymn is How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, and it's found at number 344 in Voices United. And we will sing verses 1, 3, 4, and 5, and the lyrics will also be on the monitor.
Please join me in the prayers of the people. Dear Lord, we come before you yet again in all our human frailty. We are thankful for your many blessings. We ask that you comfort the Tumashi family and friends during the shadow time of their loss and that you lighten their hearts with fond memories of their mother and our sister, Hope. We ask that you bless our king and his advisors so that through all their endeavors, they seek justice and the common good. Be with all our first responders so that they may go where others might turn away from. Be with those who are traveling so that they may travel safely to their destinations. Lift up and comfort all those who are without shelter, whether they be in Victoria Park, Hamlin's Plains, or Janine. We ask for peace in many troubled regions. In all our actions and thoughts, help us to see in the other in our lives as also made in your image and worthy of justice, respect, and love. We ask for these things in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Our final hymn is hymn number 333 in Voices United, Love Divine, All Joy Excelling, and the words will be on the monitor.